Hello, this is Dr. James Camp from Lee College in Baytown, Texas, and this is my lecture on muscle anatin fizz from gross to micro. We're going to be explaining the uh, how we get from gross muscle down to microscopic muscle, and then we're going to explain the uh, the protein level and cellular level uh, actions that cause a muscle to contract. Okay, so what's in a skeletal muscle? At some level, a skeletal muscle is composed of these little things called muscle fibers. Okay, skeletal muscle fibers are um, also known as skeletal muscle cells. Um, one muscle fiber running sometimes the entire length of a cell, in the entire length of a muscle, uh, from one tendon to the other is a single individual cell. It's a, you know, these are like the longest cells in the body in some cases. Um, and so we might also call this a myocyte. But the skeletal muscle is not just a cluster of randomly scattered myocytes. Um, all of these myocytes are clustered together into one big bundle, okay, and the Latin for a bundle is fascicle, okay, so we have muscle fibers, myocytes uh, grouped together into bundles, fascicles, and you can see there are lots of fascicles in this muscle here. Um, and then all of those fascicles are grouped together into one organ, one contractile organ, which extends down to about where the tendon begins there. And this is called a muscle belly. That's actually what it's called. The, the uh, contractile organ from, you know, the stretches from where one tendon ends to where the other tendon begins is called the muscle belly. Some muscles have multiple bellies. Some muscles have one single belly. Um, you notice that I've drawn little membranes around each of these. Each of those membranes has a name as well. Um, surrounding each muscle fiber is a um, membrane I'm drawing purple here called the endomysium. Endo meaning inside, within. Um, surrounding each Fascicle is a membrane I'm shading yellow here. Uh, that is the perimysium, peri meaning around. So around the bundle is a perimysium. And then around the entire muscle, um, this membrane that I'm shading red here, uh, we've already used peri for around, so we have to go in a layer even bigger than that. So we use epi, meaning outside or upon. So epimysium is the outside layer. Okay, so that shows us how a skeletal muscle muscle belly can be broken down into lots of fascicles and each fascicle can be broken down into lots of muscle fibers. Um, a single muscle fiber is capable of contracting on its own. That's an important thing to know about skeletal muscle is that you don't have to have the entire fascicle contract or even the entire skeletal muscle belly contract. Um, one single fiber can contract on its own and that can make the muscle get, you know, won't make it get noticeably shorter, but uh, it will cause a little twitch of that muscle. Okay, usually we try to, you know, stimulate multiple muscle fibers to contract at once, but uh, it is possible for each muscle fiber to contract the muscle on its own. Okay, within each muscle fiber there are um, these things that you can see drawn here in this sketch, and I'm going to pull one out here to show you that um, they have alternating dark and light bands to them, okay, called striations. Uh, and these are myofibrils, okay, and each myofibril is one contracting motor. Okay, these are microscopic 
um, molecular motors, we call them, protein motors that make the, uh, make the muscle cell contract. And if I were to take one of those apart, I would see that it was made of alternating thick and thin filaments, what we call protein filaments. Okay, we'll get to those in just a moment. Okay, so going from gross to micro, each of those muscles that we've learned in our class so far, the, uh, the biceps brachii or the sternocleidomastoid, all of them have at least one muscle belly to them. That muscle belly can be broken down into fascicles, and those fascicles are bundles of muscle fibers. And if you look inside a muscle cell, you'll find uh, that it's a bundle of myofibrils, which break down into protein filaments. Okay, here's a more artistic sketch of how that muscle fiber breaks down into myofibrils and myofilaments. And uh, you can see how that process works. Okay, each thick filament is surrounded by thin filaments in such a way that for the muscle to contract, the thin filaments slide into the thick filaments, okay? Um, and that ultimately pulls the edges of the muscle closer together. There would be more thick filaments out on the edges here and more thin filaments outside of them and so forth and so on, just alternating their way all the way down the whole length of the muscle. Um, the area where the thick filaments are is called the A band, which is the dark part of the, the striation pattern. The area where the thin filaments are without any thick filaments are called the I bands. Okay, for, for light. Uh, and if you need help remembering that, you can remember that dark has the letter A in it and light has the letter I in it. Okay, so light for I band, dark for A band. Um, tying all of the thick filaments together in the middle is something called the M line. And tying all of the thin filaments together in the middle is something called a Z disc. And the space from one Z disc to the next Z disc, which is the basic repeat unit of all muscle, is called a sarcomere. Okay, and we'd have another sarcomere out this way, and another sarcomere out this way, and it would just continue sarcomere after sarcomere after sarcomere uh, down the entire length of the muscle. And if one sarcomere gets shorter, then all of the sarcomeres get shorter. So anything we can do to slide these thin filaments into the thick filaments is gonna make all the sarcomeres get shorter and the whole muscle is going to contract. And this is what's known as the sliding filament theory or sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. Now let's look deeper into one of these thick filaments and see, and thin filaments and see uh, how we can understand that. Okay, the thick filament is made of a protein called myosin, which has a long tail and uh, a long tail and a little bit of a neck and a head group. Okay, the thin filament is made entirely of little a bead of little proteins called actin okay each one of these little beads on a string is actin and there are actually two strands of actin um, i drew one of them made out of beads and the other one is a line to show you how they spiral around each other okay so what ultimately needs to happen is that myosin needs to reach up grab actin and drag it in to the uh, toward the center of the thick filament, towards the M line 
uh, so that the sarcomere can get shorter. Let's see how that works. Okay, the first thing that's going to happen is that myosin is very strongly attracted to actin. It's one of the strongest uh, attractions in the biomolecular world. So as soon as myosin sees that it has an opportunity to grab onto actin, it's going to slide up into place and grab an actin. And this place where um, where uh, myosin forms a connection with actin here, um, let's see if I can do this in the color you can see, yeah. This place where myosin forms a connection to actin, it's as if they're, they've now made a bridge between the thick and thin filaments, and so this is called a cross bridge. Okay. As soon as actin connects with myosin, it's going to kind of reflexively, like, like a mouse stepping on a mouse trap, it's going to sizzle and drag actin. You see how actin moved in this case from here to here. Okay, so we moved that far toward the M line. So that's the contraction, that's the actual thing happening. And we refer to this as the power stroke of the cross bridge cycle. That's where the actual movement happens. Now, we're stuck with myosin connected to actin in a contracted, in a very slightly contracted position. You can see that, that actin moved toward the M line, but it didn't move very far. We'd like to be able to, um, to come back out here and grab another actin and drag it further in and then come grab another actin and drag it further in but we've got to let go okay myosin is very strongly bonded to actin and it's not going to let go on its own so there happens to be something myosin likes to hold on to even more than actin and that is our high energy molecule atp as soon as atp forms a complex with myosin Myosin forgets all about actin, just like a, a uh, teenage boy at a junior high dance who finds a more attractive girl. He forgets the girl he came with and goes off to play with ATP for a little while. Uh, this means we now have ATP and myosin bound together and myosin has let go of the actin. So we're now in a position where we can regenerate our original starting point. How do we do that? We use the energy from ATP to wind up the myosin head. So ATP gets converted to ADP, and then ADP, uh, and then the energy from that conversion is used to rewind the myosin head back to where we started, and now we can cycle back to the beginning of the cross bridge cycle and we're ready to form a cross bridge. You know, we had formed a cross bridge here the first time, we're ready to form a cross bridge here this time, and we can bring actin even further, bring the thin filament even further in towards the end line. Okay, so we now know the basics of the cross bridge cycle. We know how muscle contracts, um, but there's a question of control. We don't want a muscle to always contract. Um, if, uh, in fact, there's a disease out there, a very dreaded disease that makes muscles all uh, permanently contract, it's called tetanus, um, and we all get vaccinated against that as children because it's very, very dangerous. Uh, so, we don't want that. We want our muscles to relax sometimes and contract at other times. But as long as myosin sees a, a possibility to connect to actin, it's going to want to jump in there and form a cross bridge. So how do we stop it? Well, how do you stop two teenagers from dancing at a high school dance? You put a chaperone in between, and now that myosin can no longer see a, a clear pathway to connect with actin, it does not jump in there and form a cross bridge. So as long as this molecule, and these, these molecules here, the long molecule is called 
tropomyosin, and the short little round molecule here is called troponin. And as long as troponin and tropomyosin are in their chaperone position, we'll call it, um, they prevent myosin from coming in and forming a cross bridge with actin, and so the muscle does what? Well, if it can't contract, it's going to relax. So in this case, the muscle is going to, myosin's going to let go of actin, the thin filaments are going to slide out of the thick filaments again, and the muscle's going to relax. So how do we get troponin and tropomyosin out of the way? We've now created a problem. Well, it happens that when you add calcium to troponin, troponin is going to pull tropomyosin out of the way. And now myosin can see a clear pathway to jump in and form a bond with actin and cross bridges are going to start. So in this case up here with troponin and tropomyosin blocking actin, we get no cross bridges and so the muscle relaxes. Down here, where you see uh, troponin has pulled tropomyosin out of the way because it's bound to calcium, uh, we now have a clear path for myosin to form a cross bridge with actin, and so we get, so we can say yes, two cross bridges and the muscle contracts. Okay, what happens when we want to stop the muscle from contracting? Well, it's quite simple. We take the calcium away and we go back to, you know, troponin stops pulling tropomyosin out of the way and uh, tropomyosin falls back into place, into its chaperone position, and the next time myosin comes to try to form a cross bridge, there's no way to form a cross bridge, so the muscle starts to relax again. Okay, so the essential um, logic of this is um, plus calcium contract minus calcium relax. Okay, one more thing. Muscles do not exist by themselves. Each skeletal muscle fiber is innervated um, by a motor neuron, okay, or a branch of a motor neuron. Um, in this case, we see two motor neurons. Motor neuron one is blue, um, and motor neuron two is red. And the blue motor neuron uh, innervates two skeletal muscle fibers. The red motor neuron innervates one, two, three, four motor neurons. Because stimulating motor neuron one will cause both this one and this one to fire, we say that those are going to act as a motor unit. Okay, and the same for the red. The uh, activating motor neuron two will cause uh, all four of the red fibers here to to uh, to contract, and so we'll have one motor unit there. Where do these motor neurons connect? They connect at something called a neuromuscular junction. Okay, so we're going to draw that on our muscle fiber on the next slide and try to put everything together. Okay, so let's, let's try to put everything together for um, one muscle contraction. Okay, the muscle is one long cell, okay? Um, here's my sarcolemma, it's called, okay? Uh, 
like the city limit. You got lima, sarcolima. This is the, the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. Um, and I'm going to draw these little wavy lines at the end, which is something I learned in engineering class, means that a part kind of goes on and on and on forever. Like if you were drawing a little part of a car axle, you would draw these little curvy lines to show that it kept going. Um, this muscle, if it were really, um, if I blew this muscle fiber up to the, the height that it's really showing on your screen, it would be uh, easily 20 or 30 screens wide. So, you know, very, very long cells. Okay, somewhere in this cell, we're going to find um, a nucleus. Probably, we're going to find more than one because uh, skeletal muscle fibers are formed by lots of little tiny cells called myoblasts merging together into longer and longer and longer cells. And as they do, they don't lose their nuclei. Uh, this turns out to be a good thing because what is a nucleus used for? It's used for synthesizing protein. What does a muscle cell need a lot of? Protein. Okay. We'll probably also see a lot of our favorite little squiggly organelle, mitochondria. Okay, we'll see those scattered around everywhere here and there because muscle cells also need a lot of energy, a lot of ATP. Okay. In the middle of the muscle fiber, we will see lots of long, thin myofibrils. And we know that those have thick filament A bands. I'm just going to draw a few of them here because you know what we're doing here. And they've got thin filament I bands. Okay. Okay. Now, um, we know that if there's calcium in the center of this, or in the sarcoplasm, it's called, the, the open space of this muscle cell, uh, that the muscle cell is going to contract, uh, that these thin filaments will slide into the thick filaments and the muscle will contract. So how does the calcium get there? Where does the calcium go when we're not using it? Um, the answer is that there's a funny little organelle um, My nucleus back. Um, there's a funny little organelle. Um, it looks sort of like um, this. It's got two poles on either side and it's got kind of a spider web of filaments in between. And so there's one of them there. And then here's another one right next to it. And this stuff in the middle um, is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's a third form of endoplasmic reticulum. We have the rough ER and the smooth ER. Well, now you have the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the SR. Okay. And the SR stores calcium. In fact, it sucks calcium up from the cytoplasm, from the sarcoplasm, into the sarcoplasmic reticulum um, so that all other things being equal, if the muscle cell is left alone, it's gonna, the sarcoplasmic reticulum will suck up all the calcium. And what happens when we're minus calcium? The muscle relaxes. So the default state here is for the muscle to relax. How does the muscle talk to the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Well, these little things on the end are called terminal 
cisternae. Okay, a cistern is like a holding tank for something. So these are the, the holding tanks at the end, uh, terminal end. Um, and in between each pair of terminal cisternae, there's a little invagination of the cell membrane called a transverse tubule, often called a T-tubule for short. And so that talks to the terminal cisternae, which have the ability to then release calcium back into the cell. Okay, how does the cell know when to do this? Well, uh, we can redraw our sarcoplasmic reticulum so that it's got a little wavy line in one spot. This happens at one point in every uh, muscle cell. Uh, that wavy line is called a motor end plate. Okay, um, and it's the motor end plate because it's at the end of a motor neuron. Well, that motor neuron comes to something called an axon terminal or perhaps a synaptic knob. I've heard it called a terminal button. I mean, this thing has lots of names. Um, and in the axon terminal are vesicles called synaptic vesicles. Okay. And they are filled with a very special substance called acetylcholine or ACH for short. And that substance is uh, a neurotransmitter. Okay, and there are receptors for acetylcholine located on the uh, motor end plate, receptor, something that receives a signal. Okay, so special proteins that are there to listen for acetylcholine. Now we've got all the parts, we can talk about how this whole thing works. Okay, so a, a very special, um, no, you can't see that, okay, a very special electrical signal called an action potential, I'll call it an AP for short, travels down the axon of the motor neuron and arrives at the axon terminal. It can't go any further, so instead it causes calcium to move into the synaptic vesicle or into the axon terminal, which causes acetylcholine to move out of the synaptic vesicles and into the space between, which is called the synaptic cleft. Okay. When acetylcholine binds to its receptor, it lets uh, ions flow into the cell, and that creates an action potential on the surface of the, uh, the muscle cell. So that will travel in both directions down the muscle. Every time an action potential reaches a T-tubule, it travels down uh, the T-tubule as well. And when electricity passes the uh, terminal cisternae, it causes them to let um, calcium out into the cell. Okay, the calcium in the cell then moves, uh, causes troponin to move tropomyosin out of the way, um, and we get cross bridges okay we get the cross bridge cycle and so we get 
the muzzle will contract. Okay, so that's everything you need to know about muscle contraction in one um, beautifully sketched figure. Um, I hope this is all making some amount of sense to you. Um, you can proceed on to the next video I have in a row um, on zooming back out from micro to gross in talking about um, muscles in motion. Okay, thank you very much.